George Galloway, Workers' Party of Britain candidate, 12,003. I do hereby declare that George Galloway is duly... I respect the Prime Minister, I despise the Prime Minister. Just suck it up. I won the election. Something is rotten in the state of Britain. A tale of two princesses, one of them black, one of them white, both of them on the rough end of establishment treating. And we'll be talking with the man, the news outlet, Unity News Network, which is speculating that Diana may be in danger of some harm. Of course, I meant Kate, but you know, we are asking in this poll this evening, is Kate the new Diana? Why should you care? I'll explain all in the course of this, the mother of all talk shows. Stay tuned. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. Galloway, the mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. That something is rotten in the state of Britain is probably the statement of the bleeding obvious that I have ever made. It's rotten from top right down to the toe, a gangrenous toe, if you'll forgive me. We are in a very parlous state in the United Kingdom. All of our institutions are hollowed out from the collapse in trust in the police service, the collapse in the standard of justice evident in the treatment of Julian Assange, the collapse in anything remotely resembling a free and independent media in this country, the collapse in the caliber of Parliament, about which more later, where once upon a time when I first entered the House of Commons 37 years ago, there were a hundred or more men and women of independent mind, of stature, who when they rose, no one could predict exactly what they were going to say, but everyone stayed in their place in order to hear it. Compare and contrast with the political dwarves sitting all around me in the British Parliament today, most of whom I simply have never seen or heard of before. Compare the great speakers of the House of Commons that I have sat under, Sir Bernard Wetherill, Dame Betty Boothroyd, even little Berkow with the well, Calamity Jane figure of Lindsay Hoyle, who was out today in all his miserable lack of pomp. He managed to allow a race row that has brewed and broken in Britain, in which the Conservative Party's biggest donor, who donated 
10 million pounds to the British Conservative Party and in return, yes, in return, got 122 million pounds of contracts with Britain's National Health Service, was recorded saying that the Labour Member of Parliament, Diane Abbott, should be shot and that when he looks at her, he begins to hate all black women. Now, in today's era of political correctness, you just can't say things like that, especially if you're the government party's biggest financial donor, especially if you hold the gong order of the British Empire, especially if you are influential at the very top ranks of the British government. This is a racist and misogynistic piece of hate speech, as was widely recognized in the House of Commons today. The leader of the opposition, no less, no more, Sir Keir Starmer, thought the story so important that he donated half of his questions to the Prime Minister to this scandalous misogynoir against his one-time parliamentary colleague, Diane Abbott. The Prime Minister replied several times how completely unacceptable these remarks were, though not so unacceptable that he was minded to hand back the £10 million donation. The man had said sorry, he said, and remorse, where genuine, should always be accepted. Although I could give you many hundreds of examples where remorse, like Shamima Begum, she defected to ISIS, became an ISIS bride, was groomed as a young schoolgirl. She's deeply remorseful about having done it now. But the British government, Rishi Sunak's British government, actually ripped up her passport and deported her effectively to Bangladesh because her grandparents came from there. A good example where remorse is simply not enough. This multi, multi-millionaire conservative donor should have been called before the bar of the house and should have on his knees bathed the feet of Diane Abbott. But he's out, off, scot-free. Nothing will ever be said or done against him. Least of all will his 122 million contract with Britain's National Health Service be rescinded. But why am I dwelling on this point? The Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition exchanged at least six questions and answers on the case of Diane Abbott. She was then spoken about by the leader of the Scottish National Party, a fella called Flynn, I think. He also donated two of his parliamentary questions to this foul, racially and, uh, and gender-related smear against a long-standing member of the House of Commons. And the Prime Minister had to answer them in the same terms that he had answered the leader of the opposition. Everyone in the room was talking about her as if she wasn't there. But she was there, resplendent, in a red jacket, just a few yards along the back bench from me. And as I was rising, every time to be called myself, I could see with my right eye that Diane Abbott was rising to be called also. Unbelievably, the Speaker of the House of Commons did not call her to speak, even though everybody else was speaking only about her. Compounding insult added to injury. You're talking about a race row? The black woman who's been attacked is there and trying to speak and is not called. Now, 
At the time I was thinking, how is the speaker possibly going to justify not allowing a woman that everyone else is talking about to speak for herself? I knew he'd have difficulty. I didn't know he'd make such a poor job of defending it after the fact. He said they ran out of time. Except they didn't run out of time. Prime Minister's questions is supposed to last 30 minutes. Today it lasted for 38 minutes. And he still didn't call the woman of the moment. Now, look, I called her a princess earlier. She is kind of a left-wing black princess. She was one of only 17 black Cambridge University graduates in the whole of the 1970s. She was one of the only women to graduate from Cambridge from a black West Indian minority ethnic background. All of it worthy of some respect, I should have said. And she became Britain's first black woman member of parliament. She entered history as Britain's first ever black woman member of parliament. Worthy of some respect, worthy of being called to ask a question, at least a prime minister's questions about herself. But no. Not only did the speaker not call her, the leader of the opposition mercilessly exploited this race row for his own party political purposes without referring to the fact that he himself has suspended Diane Abbott from the parliamentary Labour Party with only months at best away from a general election in which she will not be allowed to stand as a Labour candidate after nearly 40 years on the House of Commons benches as a Labour MP. The reason why he suspended her? Some letter she wrote to an obscure British newspaper, which, having looked at it, I can't even begin to imagine what was exceptionable about it. Certainly nothing as exceptionable as what has now and indeed throughout her parliamentary career been said about her. She's haughty. She's imperious. She's grand. She's a grand dame. And while some might find that difficult, I personally kiss her hand. And the idea that this black woman should be spoken about by this William Zanzinger in this multi-millionaire scandal is utterly repugnant and speaks to the way that the ruling British elite really feel about women, really feel about black people, really feel about black women in particular. Now, there's another princess in the news or rather not in the news. I'm old enough to remember what happened with Lady Di, Lady Diana, Princess Diana, how she was cheated on by her husband, now the King of the United Kingdom and whatever remaining parts of the Commonwealth recognize him as their head of state, as their monarch. I'm old enough to have watched in real time how she was treated by this British royal family, the Windsors. I watched The Crown on Netflix. It was like the story of my lifetime, almost exactly coterminous with my lifetime. I watched it with great interest. And I know how the Windsors treat the wives and in the case of Princess Margaret, the putative husband, group captain Peter Townsend, I know how they behave. I know the medieval brutishness with which they respond to wives 
that have fallen out of favor. Think Henry VIII. Now I'm sure that something rotten is going on inside Buckingham Palace, inside Windsor Castle, inside Sandringham. I'm absolutely sure that there's something we are not being told about the health of the head of state. If he was just an ordinary guy, it would be none of my business. But why don't we know what kind of cancer the head of state of Britain has? Because then we might be able to evaluate whether he's going to last another six weeks or could last another six, ten, 16, 20 years. We have a right to know that. He's the head of state, albeit an utterly unelected one. I want to know what's happened to the next queen of the United Kingdom and the mother of the next but one king of the United Kingdom. I have a right to know. Not only am I a subject, because that's what we are called, folks, a subject of these people, not only do we have to pay a king's ransom for these people in order for them to rule over us, but I'm an elected member of King Charles's parliament. It's actually called his parliament. If I don't swear allegiance to him, I will not be allowed to sit down in the parliament, even if everybody in Rochdale had voted for me. Most people did. A crushing majority of people did, but even if everybody had, I would not be allowed to sit down unless I pledged allegiance, not only to him, but his heirs and his successors. But who are to be his heirs and his successors? What's happened to Kate? It's almost 80 days since she was seen in public. Such was the mounting concern about that in the country that they eventually published a photograph for Mother's Day of the aforementioned Princess Kate, looking marvelous, I must say, for a woman off sick after an ab 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 abdominal operation, wearing tight jeans, I thought, my goodness, she's recovered well. Except by the evening, all of the major news agencies issued a kill notice. I hope that's not uh, hostage to fortune. A kill notice, killing their circulation of this photograph. Why? because it had been faked, fabricated, photoshopped. Now, they haven't told us which parts of the picture were photoshopped, but it's a fair guess that it was Kate that was photoshopped. Perhaps she's not looking that well. Perhaps she wasn't even there. I'm demanding habeas corpus. Produce the body. Proof of life. We need to know, have a right to know if the Princess of Wales is alive. Is she well? What happened to her? Did she try to harm herself? Did somebody else try to harm her? What are they covering up inside the British elite? The British elite is rotten to the core. And this growing royal scandal where they cannot produce, never mind the body, even a picture in nearly 80 days, not one picture. This is a woman who when she gave birth three times came out to a barrage of press photographers within hours of having given birth and gone through labor. Nearly 80 days, not even one single picture. So when Press Association and Reuters and all the others issued their kill notice, they knew they were in trouble. So they 
presumably forced her, her, from her sick bed to say, actually, it was all her fault. She's an amateur photo editor. And if you believe that, I've got a bridge here in London that I can sell you going cheap. She took the blame for the producing, for the production of a fake photograph that was on its way to being published all over the world, except it was a fake. So they produced a second picture purporting to be her in a car with William, except she was looking the other way in the dark, and no one could claim that they knew that it was her in that picture. Might have been somebody else. And there is a somebody else. We can infer from all the coverage that like father, like son, William's been cheating on his beautiful wife for a definitely less beautiful alternative, just as Charles was cheating on his beautiful wife with a very definitely inferior model. She was at the Cheltenham horse racing today. She fitted in really well, if you get my drift. The third picture that they produced was so riven with glaring, glaring, obvious error that that too has now been accepted as being a fake. So we now have a situation where the heir to the throne has a wife, the mother of the next heir to the throne, who's gone missing. And no one in the royal family will explain what's going on. One man, David Clues, one outfit, Unity Network News, frequently reviled as conspiracy theorists until they're Conspiracy theories turn out to be true. They've been right ahead of the pack on this. They're the horse in front. And David Clues comes up right now here on the Mother of All Talk Shows. On YouTube, Keith Mitchell says, your success in Rochdale has made many, many more than just those who voted for you. As Roger Waters' mum says, do the right thing, George. Keep right with those in Rochdale and they will stand by you at the general election. I want to thank the great Roger Waters for his fulsome support in the contest. I want to thank Low Key, our own considerable genius, for coming to Rochdale and performing so brilliantly, so dazzlingly in the constituency. I want you all to write this down. I was listening today to Low Key's track, Long Live Palestine. And I always knew that it was musically extremely beautiful and inspiring. You know, the one with the chorus, free, free Palestine. But today, for some reason, in a car, I played it and I listened very carefully to the lyrics, which proved to me again that Loki isn't just a recording artist, isn't just an indefatigable activist. He is a professorial political genius. So write it down, long live Palestine. Watch it on Spotify at the end of this show by Loki, L-O-W-K-E-Y. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. So is Princess Kate the new Diana? Yes or no? You can answer on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway, on my Twitter account, on the YouTube community poll, or on the YouTube stream. And if you're watching 
on the YouTube stream. Please share with all of your contacts, all of your followers and friends. Ditto on Facebook or any other platform that you are watching on that allows that facility. Uh, so at the moment, most people overwhelmingly actually say no. We'll see if they feel the same after this interview with David Plews, who is the lead correspondent for Unity Network News, who joins me now. David, uh, welcome uh, to the mother of all talk shows. Uh, I uh, adumbrated earlier in my monologue some of the causes for concern. Maybe you can summarize your causes for concern on the question of where is Princess Kate and what's happened to her? Well, uh, I think you certainly are, are are on fire tonight. And do, do I have to doff my cap now to you? Is it the right honourable gentleman, Mr. Galloway, do we have to refer to you as now? No, no. No, no. Just call me George, David. Call me George. Well, congratulations, firstly, on an outstanding victory in, in, in Rochdale. And that really w okay. was another thing that has set the cat amongst the pigeons in the British establishment. And... Yeah. I, I I think the way you've you've introduced it tonight is 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 very right. And at the moment, people are looking at this, I think, quite flippantly with 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 what is going on with Kate and not fully appreciating the gravity of the situation that the royal family are incapable of providing clear evidence that the heir to the throne is still alive. And they have they have put out a huge... I have never seen anything... Well, I have. Um, March 2020, it was a huge bombardment of information. February 22, October the 7th. And now, to to basically say to people, oh, well, just Kate will be fine. She'll be back anytime soon. And this isn't really important. This, in my opinion, is absolutely huge. They've, as you pointed out, they've released three photos and all of them have been completely debunked. Therefore, at, at this stage, where, where is she? And and this might sound very dramatic, but it, it, it's not, there is a, a very high risk that she may be dead because they, they have not provided evidence that she's still alive. And we are now into Wednesday. This erupted on Sunday when they released that photo. That is three clear days and they have done nothing to address the speculation. So, as I say, I think there is three potential reasons for that. Firstly, she's she's dead. Secondly, she's in some sort of coma-type state, or she is incapable of speaking. Or thirdly, um, which may be a bit more palatable to people, she is just she's down tools. She's she's walk she's on a walkout. She's on a wildcat strike. She said to William, I'm not doing anything anymore. Then that then leads to the question, well, why would she be doing that? Why would she be refusing to do any media work? Well, let's pray that it is the third of those options, although the third option is serious enough for the uh, existence of the monarchy. For the avoidance of doubt, David, I'm a Republican, I, I, I don't support the idea of monarchy. Indeed, I think it is ludicrous uh, that in the 21st century we have unelected heads of state uh, chosen from a frankly long dysfunctional <laughs> family group and gene pool. But leave that aside. Uh, if we're going to have a monarchy, we ha they have rights uh, and responsibilities. So have we rights and responsibilities. I have to pledge allegiance to them, even to sit as an elected member of the British Parliament. So I'm entitled to ask, where is she? How is she? Let's, though, well, if, if, because we don't want to be morbid, concentrate on your third option, that she's downed tools. Speculate for me. What might be the reasons for that? Um, well, and and I, I put this out quite flippantly. If if you were a, a person who lived their lives, say on on benefits or were actively seeking work, and you weren't turning up for your appointments, <laughs> the, the the benefits office would be quite allowed to 
ask why not and there are no bigger scroungers of course than the the sax cobar gothas the third option that that she has decided to down tools and and again like a lot of people say well we shouldn't really be speculating about this and i really push back on that george and i'll tell you why these people need to be brought down a peg or two because they are not above being spoken about they are not divinely ordained they are just like you and me just because they have fancy titles and just because they live in castles doesn't make them better than anybody else and trust me you're being told not to speculate on them and that it's unfair they and their ilk have sent tens of millions of working class britons to their deaths um over the centuries with with total disregard for life so i as i said i have no sympathy at all with them and and the speculation and everything that's taken place on the third point the the rumor is that that prince william has had an affair um i believe it's with the 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 marquis of um chalmondley marchioness sorry of chalmondley a lady who goes by the name of rose hanbury and he's he's had some form of affair and and again look it's all it's all speculation but that has been reported extensively in the spanish media it's also been uh, put extensively in in american media as well that 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 is a cause of it and this doesn't come as a surprise again this is the point i try and get across most people are decent we are not dealing with decent people. We are dealing with people who have stolen the vast majority of wealth that they have over the decades. They have then awarded themselves titles, as Tony Bla- Tony Ben famously pointed out about them, and then reign, reign over you. And th- this is, again, what people need to get their head in. These aren't people dealing with sums in the tens of thousands, millions, hundreds of millions. We're talking about people managing things worth billions then above them trillions the governments run budgets of trillions the amount of 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 power that is involved in maintaining that again i think it's just beyond the 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 cognizance of of most people and they will do everything that they can to maintain that power so there's so much speculation and and i think we have to go back again to when this all started, George. And, and it did start a few weeks back when you had the death of Jacob Rothschild that was was announced. And again, people will say, well, what's that got to do with it? Well, if, if you do a wee bit of research, you know that the Rothschild family have been intimately involved with the House of Windsor and the British establishment for hundreds of years. They've financed many wars. Of course, the Balfour Declaration with the State of Israel was sent to Lord Rothschild. So he he supposedly died aged 87. Then on the Tuesday, you had William mysteriously pull out of the the ceremony, remembering the, the death of King Constantine. And then the days are a wee bit mixed up. We don't know. You had the suicide of Thomas Kingston, who was uh, Prince Michael of Kent's son. Uh, 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 by all accounts, a highly successful individual wife family money that most people could dream of he went to his parents house in the cotswolds had a a a spot of lunch and his father then took the dogs out for the walk his father came back couldn't find his son came across a locked farmhouse and his son was found with a traumatic head wound which they are saying was a shotgun wound to the head and and a shotgun next to him i I, i'm I'm sorry but and then all this stuff with Kate, this is not a coincidence. There's there's something going on. It is obviously, it's very hard to pinpoint exactly, but there's something big happening. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, let me take you back a bit. Um, <clears throat> the apple doesn't fall far from the tree and all that. Uh, if William had this affair with Chalmondley, uh, then... He would be acting as exactly as his father did, and indeed as royals and the rapacious aristocracy have done for centuries. Would that in itself be enough uh, for uh, Kate to down tools, come out on a wildcat strike? 
I, 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 again, and and I think this is this is, it, it, I think there's maybe something a bit more to it than that. Um, as I said, the, the the cover story that's been put out is that she was getting some form of 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 stomach surgery. I mean, again, there is a lot of rumours, unsubstantiated of pregnancies, of of abortions, of of who was the father. Uh, again, though, people are just like, oh, this is just nonsense. The royals have been doing this for hundreds of years. They had, they used to have loads of illegitimate children. They would, they would, and the royals used to go around murdering people. <laughs> I mean, do you honestly think that? Do people honestly think they've stopped doing that? Do you think they've just woken up one day and said, "Oh no, we're going to be civilized now"? You know, they they fundamentally see themselves as being of a higher caste, and and the the, the rest. So, I, I I just say that I think the the darkest thoughts that we can have. I also put this out the other day to people saying, oh, this is just ridiculous. Well, if, if I'd said that, you know, uh, 30 years ago, that see this man that, that everybody says is fixing it for everybody and he's friends with the, the royals, he's friends with everyone, and this man has a pass to a hospital and he's 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 sexually abusing dead bodies, people just said, well, I mean, that's a bit of a stretch too far, and that turned out to be true. The same as Jeffrey Epstein as well. Like you said that at the start about conspiracy theories come conspiracy facts that this guy was operating an international child sex trafficking blackmail plot on behalf of Mossad. People would be like, geez, this guy's this guy's lost it. It's it's true. And and and, and I just think where we are now in 2024, when so much of this has come out to the public, when so much of this is 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 out there, that people are just now thinking anything is possible after after all these series of events. Yeah, uh, I mean, if the establish, let's say that some, God forbid, terrible harm has befallen her, uh, and they simply are not telling us uh, what and how. Uh, I mean, they can't keep that up forever. I mean, mm. even the you're right to say the Spanish media. The American media now, American mainstream television, is talking about this affair, this weird set of circumstances. It's only the tame British establishment media that won't give this story an airing at all. And we'll call people mm -hmm. like you and tomorrow people like me uh, conspiracy theorists for even speculating uh, about it. But they'll not be able to keep that up for long david what what no. might be the game plan on the establishment it's, it's it's funny the thing that just popped into my head and and it is about the royals and who knows what goes on that the theory you you'll know this about lord lord mountbatten was was blown up when he was on a boat when he was in the republic of ireland the story that really does the rounds now was that was actually the, the british security services that did that because they knew about mountbatten's pedophilia I mean that is that is that is 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 really come out now. So, uh, like the, the British regime doesn't work. There are factions within the wider British regime. There will be some people that don't like William. They don't like Kate. They maybe don't like Charles. They're maybe using each other. I, I just I, I, who knows how this is going to play out. But I don't think you should underestimate this could be the the end of the royal family, and the fact that. The, the Prince William has is, is even said that he doesn't want to be head of the Church of England. Well, how can you have a royal family who's not the head of the Church of England? And I know this doesn't matter to most people. Nowadays, it's it's considered far away, but that is a fundamental part of how the systems run. It would, it would lead to the disestablishment of the Church of England from the, 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 the royal family. I think this could all move very, very quickly. I mean, one of those, one of those crazy situations mm. is you've got Prince Charles, who's not being seen, he's, uh, that's the other thing, I forgot to even mention that as well, you had Charles and his cancer diagnosis as well, that 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 started all this off, and then you've got you've got this ludicrous yeah, and, situation and I don't think, you know, it's not that we're prying here, David uh, I, I, I don't want to see his x-rays uh, but no. I think I have a right to know whether the head of state has a cancer that gives them a chance of lasting the next six weeks or the next six years. I think I've got a right to know that, don't you? 
Well, yes, because he is, as as you correctly pointed out, he is the head of state. You know, you look at America; they have they get their medicals done. I mean, I know a lot of that's fudged, but the the you you have a right and you have a right to ask questions. And the British media is covering up for this. The you you look at the headlines, the tabloids, and the Sun, etc. They don't want people asking questions. They obviously know something is taking place. Because the, the 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 monarchy really does represent a linchpin of the British establishment, and if if that goes, then a lot of legit this could this could all a lot of dominoes could fall very 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 quickly. Mm -hmm. And the problem for the monarchy is the monarchy is a fundamentally small c conservative institution, yet it's trying to appeal to obviously Britain is very different now from what Britain was forty fifty years ago. And they're, I don't know how they do that. And especially when they want to maintain their powers and and, and privileges. And, and the only thing I will say, George, is I've got that building in the back. All, all I ask for is the East Wing come the revolution. Okay. And, and, and yeah. Windsor Castle. And the, I don't know what else part of it you would like. And we'll, we'll be burning the fire. We'll be burning the furniture for firewood, I'm sure. <laughs> Now, look, David, I've got to reiterate, these are just rumours about uh, yes. William and this lady, Chormondly. Uh, and, uh, of course, the palace has said that Kay is recovering from abdominal surgery. And, of course, we all hope that that's true. Uh, but if she's recovering from abdominal surgery, why put out a photograph, which you were the first I saw, uh, to unmask as a fake. Why Why well, put the, the, out a family picture that wasn't it, actually their family on, on Mother's Day? It, it was, yeah, I mean, we. I think we were one of the first to call it as fake. Just, well, the first thing I noticed was she was wearing skinny jeans and she's supposed to have had, had a, a, a abdominal surgery. I mean, there, there, is, there is another thing about that photo. The photo was, after simple inspection, blatantly photoshopped and... Thing is, it, it wasn't just slightly edited. It, it was com it was completely fake. People were going to realise it was fake. So why why again would they do that? And this this is the other thing as well. It's strange enough. If you looked at it, all the children in the photo had their fingers crossed. Now, people, oh, you're just reading into things. No, uh, symbolism is very very important with these things. It's it is it, it was it was obviously going to get found out that it was and it wasn't just and and it was interesting. You, they say that Kate then apologised the next day for touching up the photos. No, she didn't. Kensington Palace issued a statement on behalf of Kate Middleton. We don't know whether she said that at, at all. As I point out, no one has heard from her or seen her in public since the twenty fifth of December. That is seventy nine days. That's that's a long time, it's, uh... and that photo just was. And then it was, it, the, as you said, the one the day after the, 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 them leaving Windsor Castle, and and it's a person. It's the side of her head looking out a window, and that was again made up. I mean, this is just, it's absolutely crazy. Well, I suppose we'll have to follow the Spanish press uh, to uh, find out what's happening within the head of state's family in Great Britain. That has yes. come to something. David Clues, Unity Network News. Let more power to your elbow and may everyone follow you. Now, thanks for Thank you, George. that feast of speculation, uh, which may turn out to be fact. Is Princess Kate the new Diana? Yes. Or no, get voting now. Why don't we suspend all candidates in all parties in all elections until Israel approves them? Is that the democracy we want? And we have to ask ourselves, why is the entire political class in Britain, in thrall to a tiny little country 2,200 miles away from here, and nothing can be said by anybody here 
which they don't like. What is it? What hold is it that this little country has on our politics in Western countries? We all know in America it's about money, but the sums of money here in Britain are paltry. By American standards, you'd laugh. Are these people enthralled to Israel for three, four, or five thousand pounds? In which case, they're precious cheap. If other lobbyists knew how cheap they were, they'd be moving in and getting a piece of the action. I don't know what the situation is. I don't know why they are so terrified of Israel that they're ready to sack their own candidates in the middle of a by-election. That's how scared of Israel they are. And when this is all over, we have to ask ourselves how, why, when British politics became effectively outsourced to Netanyahu's Israel, whose pleasure or displeasure dictates who can stand, who can win, who can be elected, and what policy they can follow. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, I omitted to give you the telephone numbers. Uh, if you're in the U.S. or Canada, uh, it's toll-free. The number is plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. If you're in the U.K. or Ireland, it is, uh, again, free of charge, 0808196522. If you're in the rest of the world, it's 4420396262525. Now, our podcast, by the way, 3.1 million people watched the mother of all talk shows last week. Last week, 3.1 million people. Uh, but our podcast is going through the roof. Uh, it's number one in Bahrain on Apple Podcasts. It's number two in Croatia and number five in Guatemala, which is, of course, uh, neither uh, of uh, Croatia nor Guatemala are particularly full of English speakers. Uh, and it's number five also in Cyprus. Now, you can download the podcast now by scanning the QR code on the screen now. So, let's go to the lines. Let's see who's up first while you get voting on the poll also. I can't see who's on the line first. So let me go to Terry in Liverpool about the miners, which is the 40th anniversary of the miners' strike beginning this month. Terry, welcome, sir. Hi, George. Fantastic to see you with Arthur Scargill on that match. We should never forget, and it, we should yeah. never forget. Uh, the Workers United no. will never be defeated, and you're the head of it, the um, Workers' Party. And we've got to get our okay. boots on and we've got to protest because we have the power. The politicians don't have the power. We have it. We've got to realise it and then we can change things to the better. Uh, Terry, as Jim Larkin said, uh, a man formerly of our parish, uh, the great only appear to be great as long as the rest of us are on our knees. When we stand up, they ain't so great after all. Michael is in Detroit, Michigan, on Gaza. Michael, welcome. Yes, Mr. Galloway. I'm honored, thrilled to be uh, able to talk to you today. And I want you to know that all Thank the you. way out here in Michigan, there are so many people thrilled by your victory. <laughs> so uh, it's not Thank just uh, in England, but all over the country, and Thank especially you. here in Michigan. Thank you. I want to tell everybody Thank also you. that... Uh, I've been uh, joined Patreon a while ago, and it's incredibly easy, and it's one of those things, I mean, for a whole year, it took less than a minute to do it. It's really nothing, a whole year, something like $50, and it is something cathartic about it because we're frustrated. We don't have a voice. We want to talk about Gaza. We want to do something to help, and this is something that we can see the results of right away because your voice is always out there, and it's loud and strong. And you are of such character 
integrity. It is, uh, it, we're fortunate to have someone like you as a voice out there. Now, I wanted to tell my story very quickly. My name is Mormon Abel mm-hmm. Wahab, and I am of uh, Egyptian origin. I was born in Cairo, and I came to the United States as a four-year-old with my immigrant parents. When I turned 17, on my birthday, actually, I returned and traveled North Africa from Morocco, Algeria, Libya, Egypt. I went across to Malta. And at that time, in 1975, I tried to enter Gaza. So I was on a, basically a land trek clear across North Africa. I was not allowed from Egypt into Gaza, and at the time, Israel had occupied the Sinai all the way up to the Suez Canal. Now, they told me I was welcome to go to uh, Tel Aviv and enter there as a tourist and to bring plenty of uh, American greenbacks, but they would not allow me, and that is where I was interested in going. I wanted to see Gaza and to enter that way. But it is incredible that we're talking 50 years ago, Mr. Galloway, and the situation was identical to what it is today. They had completely, at the time, they were actually physically inside of Gaza, but they re- regulated every aspect of every Palestinian's life in Gaza, just as it is today, including calories. Uh, it's an amazing thing that every day they would have some kind of specialty, 18, 19-year-old kids sitting at the crossing deciding what could come in and what can't come in. There was one day when I was there, for instance, it was uh, dialysis machines that they could not bring in dialysis machines because they said they would never allow a dialysis machine to come into Palestinians until there's a dialysis machine for every Jew in Israel. I mean, this is crazy stuff, but this is the kind of stuff that they would say. Now, I want everybody to know that the Rafa Gate is not what they tell you it is. This is not a crossing controlled by Egypt. This Egypt does have soldiers there, but it is controlled by Israel. And it is so by treaty. When they signed a treaty between Egypt and Israel in 1979, this was stipulated in the treaty, which shows you how much of this stuff was thought out ahead of time by the Zionists that control Israel. Way back then, they had thought about wanting to control Gaza in the fashion that they do today. Now, on the other side, well, uh, as far as the Rafa gate goes, the trucks do not enter directly into Rafa. They have, they are first rerouted through a base. One of Israel's bases is located a couple of uh, kilometers south of Rafa, one of the biggest military bases, actually. At the time, there was something like uh, eight squadrons of F-16s that were flying out of it. I'm not sure if they were F-16s or whatever they were, but this is a big base. And at the edge of the base, every single truck was inspected. Anything that they did not like, and they just simply made up stuff. If it was expensive, you know, for instance, today, if it's an MRI machine or something, they just take it. They keep it. But even back then, this anything that went into Gaza had to go through this base first, Mr. Galloway, before it could go enter the Rafa gate. Now, on the other side, the Reds crossing, they had set up there, there were uh, Zionists that set up tables on the highway that leads to it where they would sell the stolen loot that came off the trucks. They would set it up, and these were the soldiers. Well, these were basically kids, and they would have their relatives or friends, and they would come and grab whatever they had stolen off the trucks that day and resell it, or they would keep it. They would take it home, give it to their relatives. It was a business. It was a business when they tell you that the Palestinians have wasted uh, millions and billions of dollars on Hamas. It's it's not true. Everything that goes into Gaza is allowed in by the Zionists, and they do not allow much. Well, what a powerful uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, Thanks uh, for uh, that tour de force and that trip down memory lane, proving uh, beyond any kind of contradiction that this didn't start on October 7th last year. Uh, and uh, I think everyone will have been impressed by the uh, historical context which you have kindly given to the story today. Let's go to Virginia, where Andrew wants to talk about the same subject. Go ahead, Andrew. Yes. Hi, George. 
Uh, the other week I talked to you and I befuddled your mind about uh, how Netanyahu was insane. I just wanted to clarify that with this uh, statement. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Moshe Yatron, a prominent Israeli psychiatrist, was found dead in his home in Tel Aviv in June 2010 from an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. A suicide note at his site explained that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who had been his patient for the last nine years, had sucked the life right out of me. I can't take it anymore, wrote Yatron. Robbery is redemption. Apartheid is freedom. Peace activists are terrorists. Murder is self-defense. Piracy is legit. It's me. He is also yeah, the uh, it author is, uh, of truly, the... Uh, you know, truly, I've got to uh, move on, but thanks uh, for that, Andrew. Truly Orwellian times uh, that we are uh, living in. So if you're in the U.S. or Canada, it's plus one, eight four four nine four four double three double four. If you're in the UK or Ireland, it's 0808196552. If you're in the rest of the world, it's 442039662625. Is Princess Kate the new Diana? Yes or no? 15,419 people have voted. And by a slightly lesser margin now, most people say no. Of course, the question is a bit of a double entendre, and some may have uh, been confused as to how to vote. I think by which this question is supposed to mean this. Is Kate being edged aside? Because like Diana before her, she refused to go on playing ball. She refused to go on turning a blind eye. She refused, in that great phrase of David Clues, uh, she downed tools. She called herself out on a wildcat strike. Or are none of these things true? Is it as simple as the palace have made out? And is it just that perhaps the toll of the operation was such that she doesn't particularly feel like being photographed right now? That would be entirely understandable, if true. And perhaps Prince William, unlike his father, is as pure as the driven snow, would never dream of having hamburger outside when he has such a beautiful wife at home. Uh, that's, I suppose, an alternative reading. Uh, that could be uh, true. I want your take on the matter. I want you to tell me what you think. I'm, I've lost touch with the base. I've no idea if they can hear me, so I'm going to keep talking. I have just called for the resignation of the Speaker of the House of Commons, not just for what happened today, which was a very considerable offence against a black woman member of Parliament much offended against. It's not only that though that was serious enough. It is the fact that in order to save Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, the Speaker of the House of Commons cheated the British people and the Parliament itself of the ability to vote for a clear ceasefire now motion by allowing the utterly confected and deliberately uh, obscure uh, and uh, obfuscated Labour alternative amendment to be carried completely against parliamentary procedure, which he himself admitted that it was completely against parliamentary procedure. He then invented this cock and bull story uh, that it was all about the protection of MPs. Well, I've been uh, a member of parliament now uh, since the 29th of February. I had a meeting with the Speaker and with uh, uh, several uh, of the police officers and other agencies in the House of Commons since when I've heard nothing at all. Nothing has been done to give me the protection that I need uh, to do my job 
uh, speaking without fear or favor on Middle East, British, Eastern European, or any other matter. I have that right. This is a democracy. I have that right to speak, and I have the right not to be killed for having done so. And I have no idea when, if at all, they are ever going to afford me the protection I need, but I now know that I cannot count on the Speaker of the House of Commons to order them to. And so, for lots of reasons, I have this evening called for the resignation of Speaker Lindsay Hoyle. I'll be back after the break where we've got lots of calls and a terrific guest still to come. Stay tuned. It's the mother. George, I'm just looking at another dimension in this uh, Gaza war conflict. Could this be a religious conflict in the guise of it's not Islam versus Christianity versus Judaism, but an ideology, a, a Zionist ideology in establishing their leader that is supposed to come in, in the future and they will then govern and rule? It's in their ideology, for sure. The Zionists are uh, no more and no less than a nationalist ideology. They are nothing whatsoever to do with religion. Anybody who thinks Netanyahu is religious hasn't looked too closely into his private life. These people are extreme nationalists, exceptionalists. Some Americans believe in American exceptionalism. Zionists believe in Jewish exceptionalism. Nobody in truth is exceptional. There's nothing religious about it. It's about land. It's about nationalist supremacy, ethno-religious supremacy on the land of Palestine. And the Europeans colonized Palestine in the same way that the Europeans colonized South Africa. So fitting, the victims of white European colonialism are coming to the aid of other victims of white European colonialism and they're doing the whole world a signal service. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. We've got the great one and only Kim Iverson coming up from the Kim Iverson Show, one of the best American guests we've ever had. But first, an email from Farida, Ramadan Mubarak. Kate cannot and should not be the next Diana. She has her own right and her own standard. Comparing her to her mother-in-law is unfair. Diana was groomed to be a baby carrier for the now king. Kate and William were already in a relationship before marriage. Regards, Farida. Fair points, Farida. Al is in Italy on the royal family. They probably know more about what's going on than we do here in Britain. Al, welcome back to the show. Uh, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Galloway. That is something I would like uh, to read out to you, which you are extremely familiar with, but for the purpose of your viewer, they may or may not be uh, familiar with. And I would like to ask you a specific question following these lines. It says, November the 2nd, 1917, Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with the Jewish Zionist aspiration which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, not in Yorkshire, not in, Man in Manchester, in Palestine. The question I'd like to ask you, should the royal family make a formal apology to the Palestinian people and compensation paid for the devastation they have done to these poor people, tore their, their, their life apart? 
Do you think you can run a poll? Well, uh, 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 please, an, ap on your uh, an apology, yeah, uh, an apology wouldn't be worth the paper it wasn't written on. Uh, and so uh, I don't think that such, if you like, performative demands are particularly useful now. I, I think it more useful to resurrect the second paragraph of that Balfour Declaration, which explicitly states that nothing shall be done which prejudices the interests of the existing non-Jewish population in Palestine. So uh, that's a hundred and what, nearly 10 years, coming up for 10 years ago uh, now. It's more of interest that Britain made that promise, promising one people the land of a second people before they even possessed Palestine as a colony to give away to anybody at all. It was a monumental piece of imperial grandeur uh, that uh, has had catastrophic results, literally catastrophic results. But there's one thing I will say for the royal family. I'll say for the late Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II, she never visited Israel. Imagine, all the time she was in power, 70 years of her reign, she went to practically every country in the world, but she never visited Israel. And that was deliberately so, because she knew of the terrorist campaign against Britain, against British soldiers, against British officials that had been conducted to give birth to uh, this state of Israel. The Queen never went there. They must have invited her 500 times, but she never accepted their invitation. Let's go from Italy to Scotland, where Jesse wants to talk about Israel also. Go ahead, Jesse. Good evening, Mr. Galloway. It's a pleasure Thank speaking you. to you. Now, there's been something that's been Thank bothering you. me for some time, and uh, a man-made disease and the intense, as I understand, vaccination that has happened in Israel. I'm wondering if you have any opinion on what effect that that might have had uh, on decisions that were made in that country when normally... What vaccination uh, are you talking about? Well, I guess it's the vaccination, isn't it? I, they've had, I don't know how the many they've COVID, had there. COVID vaccination. Aye. Uh -huh. um, okay. So, I, honestly, I just want your opinion. If you think that knowing both sides, that this seems extreme uh, in, in, in the outcome, and if uh, yeah, something it's, like it's this off the would charts, affect... Uh, even by their previous standards. So you're, th you're linking the vaccine to the behavior of uh, the Netanyahu government. Is that your point, Jesse? I don't know if I'm linking it. I'm asking the question is, there's two realities going yeah. on here, which seems to be, it, this seems to cause. And even outside of the area, further away in the east, is this some massive experiment on separate and divide? No, I think I can confidently assert uh, that the behavior of Netanyahu and his gang of cutthroats has nothing to do with the COVID vaccine. I do so confidently because I have lived through, for over 50 years, uh, spasm after spasm of murderous violence uh, from the Israeli state against its occupied and uh, prison Palestinian uh, population long before there was anything called COVID, long before there was anything called the uh, vaccine. I've also lived through a period in which uh, Israel has become more and more and more utterly, politically speaking, unhinged. It has moved from, in my time, from labor governments led by cuddly uh, politicians uh, like Shimon Peres, like Yitzhak Rabin, the one not cuddly to me, but they made great efforts 
uh, to seem cuddly in Western public opinion. Uh, Golda Meir, uh, everybody's uh, grandma, yeah? Uh, they've moved from that all the way to General Sharon, through Begin, through Shamir, and now they've ended up with a cabinet where Netanyahu is the, uh, the liberal, the least, least fascistic element in the, uh, in the picture. Uh, so uh, all of that long predated uh, COVID, and I don't believe it's an experiment either. I believe it is in the nature of uh, the colonizing of other people's countries. Um, all colonizers end like this. They don't all get the chance to, maybe not even willing to, go to the extreme lengths that the Israeli colonizers are doing now. Uh, I've made the point many times. Imagine if in defense of our colony in the north of Ireland, uh, we had completely leveled West Belfast, <laughs> reduced it to ash and ruin, and killed tens of thousands of Irish people, women and children, leaving them in the rubble in order to defend our colony there. The British did not do that. The Israelis are doing that. Coming up is Kim Iverson. She's really something. The host of the Kim Iverson Show after this quick break. I defy anyone to contradict the point that I just made that every person alive today was born of woman. So why would we say that the people in the labor wards, in the maternity units, are people who are giving birth? Why can't we say women? Why can't we say mothers? Why can't we say women who are breastfeeding, mothers who are breastfeeding? Why do we need to say people who are chest feeding. All of these words, and indeed all of the trend that you say you dissociate yourself from, of transgenderism, transmania, I call it, are all taking rights away from women. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Is Princess Kate the new Diana? Answers on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway, on my Twitter, on the YouTube community poll, or on the YouTube stream. Kim Iverson's one of my favorite American broadcasters. I'm so glad that she's joining us again this evening. Kim, welcome back on the mother of all talk shows. Can I uh, trouble you to comment on the British royal family? I do, for this reason only... Um, because I'm sure it's not top of your agenda, but you actually are quite likely to know more about what's going on than we can, because we have basically <laughs> a, a blanket uh, covering uh, the truth, a blanket covering uh, accurate information or any information at all. Uh, what are you hearing, reading, seeing about this subject in the U.S. media? of Kate Middleton, that she's just disappeared, that nobody knows where she is, <laughs> at the, of the latest photoshopped, yes. uh, photoshopped photograph. I mean, that's what we're getting. We're getting is that there was a, photogra a, a photoshopped photograph. She had surgery, right, and then she uh, hadn't been seen from, and then there was this photoshopped thing, the photoshopped picture. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I have to admit that I love following the royal family. <laughs> it's like my guilty pleasure. <laughs> but... Um, who knows what's going? I mean, there's no. Some people have said, "Oh, she's run off." You know, she's she's like defected to Russia or something. You know, so stupid, stupid theories. But uh, otherwise, I have no idea what is going on with that whole thing. Except we saw her riding I wondered, with her mom. I wondered when. Yeah, I, I well, except it may not have been her in that picture. It certainly didn't look like her. Um, now, of course, we don't know what the impact of surgery has on someone's physiognomy, uh, but uh, it's uh, quite odd that no verifiable picture has been produced in 79 days. 
uh, since we right. Lost, that's not uh, the picture, by so the way, that, that I they're wonder, showing. I don't think. I don't think that's the photograph. There is a picture of her with her mom. No. And I think she's in the front seat. Isn't isn't uh, that the one that they said? Oh, she's been spotted. Except except it's widely believed that that isn't her either. Uh, but let's yeah. not uh, let's not get d uh, bogged <laughs> down on picture gate. Um, I'm uh, I'm just. You know, I was wondering when Russia would finally get mentioned in uh, the context of this disappearing Princess Kate uh, and Putin would get the blame. Uh, I didn't expect it to be on my own show. But, yeah, uh, if she's run away <laughs> anywhere, me. I must hope... <laughs> there. Yeah, or from you. I, mu <laughs> I, I must hope if she has run away that she's run away to a family values type place like Russia. Kim, you've got your own royal family, the Biden crime family. Uh, how are they faring these days? What ever happened to Hunter Biden? And how is Joe doing? Well, uh, Joe is to be expected for somebody who is suffering from some mental, you know, loss and, and mental decline. Uh, although, interestingly, during the State of the Union address, he seemed really spunky, like maybe... Hunter is around and Hunter maybe spiked his coffee with something because Joe was very animated. I was very surprised by the State of the Union address and how animated Joe Biden was. Um, you know, there look, it's just right now it's the same as it's always been, which is that there is a group of people who, and rightfully, I think are trying to get to the bottom of whether or not there's some corruption with Joe Biden and and Ukraine and um you know, as foreign entanglements. How did somebody who has served in the public, and you know, as somebody who's been serving in government for a long time, there's there shouldn't be a lot of money in it. And yet Joe Biden is very wealthy. No, His family get rich. is very wealthy. You don't get rich. Well, he yeah, certainly has. Yeah, you don't has, get rich and so uh, from being an elected politician. I can assure you of that. But the Bidens have got very rich indeed. Yeah, very rich, uh, very rich. So, I, you know, th there's still a lot of questions around that. I'm not sure how deep anyone in our politics really want to go. I think they want to go far enough to just ensure that, that Biden doesn't win another election. But I don't believe that our political leaders are actually going to go after him and actually dig up real crime because then the, the finger eventually goes back on them as well. There's so many that are corrupt in our political system on both sides of the aisle. They don't want us to really snuff it out. They just want enough to ensure that Joe Biden is looked at in a negative light by the population so that maybe so that they would, uh, you know, just kind of to edge him out on, in the upcoming election that's happening this November. I, I did an interview earlier this evening with my old friend Rick Sanchez uh, uh, about and I heard him say he was talking before he came to me about Biden's poll numbers. Uh, they, they have plummeted again. It's inconceivable that this uh, mentally challenged old man could win another four-year term, is it? Well, I think it is inconceivable if the voters actually have a say, uh, you know, but anything's possible if you're going to work around the voters in some crafty, clever, creative ways, then anything's possible. But yeah, he's very, he's extremely, extremely unpopular. And I think what voters are starting to realize now is that he's not worse than Donald Trump. People were, when they voted for him the first time to try to defeat Donald Trump, I think a lot of those people feel like, what was the point of that? We're in a worse spot now than we were with Donald Trump. So just go back to the guy that maybe he's, uh, you know, on Twitter, he's he's uh, says a lot of stuff. Maybe he's crass and the things that he says, and he's not, he's definitely not politically correct, but we were in a much better position with Donald Trump as president. And I think they're also seeing the very things that they really went after Donald Trump for, the border and, and racism and war. They're seeing that Joe Biden is worse on all of those points. So, you know, I, I think a lot of people who were independent who voted for Donald Trump, they're not buying, they're, who voted for Biden, they're not buying that this time around. So yeah, his poll numbers are terrible. There is no real, inconce there's no conceivable way he can win unless they rig it which they might. Yeah, I imagine that it's come to this, that we can, uh, with equanimity, uh, exchange the possibilities that uh, he might uh, win it if they rig it. Uh, they might win it if they 
uh, knock the Republican Party's candidate off the ballot. Imagine. Right. Like a banana republic. The banning of the, the major rival candidate, the kind of thing that would get you invaded by the United States uh, in Latin America. It's come to something that we, we have to worry whether Donald Trump will be uh, terminated with extreme prejudice. What kind of democracy is this? Well, maybe it's not one. <laughs> maybe it's not one. Uh, maybe we've just been told that it is one. Certainly a lot of the things that we've been told in by our political class, by our media, by the gaslighting, have panned out to not be true. I mean, when we look at all of our foreign policy decisions, all of this supposedly to free people, save lives, save lives. Could you imagine uh, the, the saying that with a straight face? Um, and spreading, demo you know, we're doing all of these things to save the world, to spread democ de democracy, to save lives. And yet all of that is panning out to be untrue. There's just more truths coming out about our political, about our political leaders, about our elites, about our government, that a lot of Americans who really believed that we lived in the best country in the world, because we've been taught that since we were born, that we were lucky to be born in the United States of America. Many, I think, are now starting to say, my government has lied to me my entire life. What other lies have they told us? And I think a lot of people are starting to feel like the facade of democracy is one of those things, that they really ultimately just put into power who they want in power, and they'll do anything to ensure that the people who they don't want in power don't get into power. Donald Trump, I think, is the closest uh, to, you know, he's a, he's a person that's been able to buck all of that and defy them no matter what. And I think that, and that obviously is very aggravating to them because they're doing everything they possibly can to ensure that he doesn't end up in the White House. And they, there's just one more move for them to make, and I, I'm afraid they'll make it, where they just make it to where he really cannot because he's not around. Yeah, uh, if I were him, I'd, I'd hire a, a group of uh, retired Russian Spetnats uh, security, probably <laughs> the best uh, available. I'm thinking of doing it myself because the British are not going to protect me. Um, but uh, one thing that is new this week, Kim, is that Joe Biden uh, has begun to turn on, or at least wants us to believe he's turned on, his former BFF, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, we're asked to believe that he was secretly overheard telling a group of people at the end of the State of the Union that he's, uh, he's going to have to have a come-to-Jesus moment. Uh, with uh, Netanyahu, a very odd choice of words indeed. Uh, but <laughs> is it true? Is he turning against Netanyahu? Or does he realize that he's lost so much ground as a result of having supported Netanyahu to the extent that he has? Which is it? He's certainly not turning on Netanyahu. It is just rhetoric. He realizes that his numbers are down. He realizes that the voting base is not in support of, of what the political class wants, which is supporting Israel endlessly without any, uh, any, you know, any restraints on them whatsoever. And so he's just saying things in order to try to please the voting base, but nothing. And if you listen to what even Netanyahu said on uh, Monday, so you have Joe Biden on the State of the Union having this, this hot mic saying, come to Jesus moment with Netanyahu, and then Netanyahu comes out Monday going around in various different interviews and uh, making it very clear that Joe Biden is a friend and that uh, of his and is and that he's happy with the support that the Biden administration has given him. So Netanyahu is not upset. He's not thinking that the U.S. got when has Netanyahu ever said, do more, do more for us. He's never needed to say that because we're doing everything they ask. So as long he doesn't care, what does Netanyahu care? If Joe Biden makes a comment in the press or says something here and there just for show, he ultimately gets what he wants. And behind closed doors, that's probably the conversation he has really, truly with people in the administration, which is, well, you're getting what you want. So it doesn't matter what the politicians say for political reasons. Yeah, quite extraordinary. And there's no sign of him coming to Jesus uh, yet. Uh, the uh, <laughs> outcome of the November election, of course, uh, remains to be seen. But the one thing you can be sure of is that the losers of the American election will be 
the ordinary Joe and Joanne uh, in the United States. We keep hearing that the American, we keep hearing from Biden that the American economy is uh, doing well, but it doesn't look like that to me. How does it feel to you, Kim? Well, um, certainly it doesn't, it, it, the grocery prices, the gas price, everything's very high here right now. So it doesn't feel like the economy is booming. Um, people are, there's just a lot of struggling going on. We see endless homelessness in this country, yet we're signing checks away to, to all these other foreign countries. So, you know, there's this idea that the, the economy is booming, but people are working many jobs to make ends meet. You know, the gig economy is strong, but that, so that makes people work three jobs in order to make ends meet. Um, people are not able to afford, with having good jobs and really great salaries, they're not able to afford even just one-bedroom apartments in many of the major cities in America. So they have to get roommates, and they're making hundred grand a year. I mean, so the economy is not great. We're not doing well. The government, our government really needs to be focusing on how they can help the middle class flourish in America. The middle class is dwindling rapidly, and the poor just get poorer. But if you can't have a strong middle class, then you don't have a strong nation. And our middle class is being demolished. Now, uh, finally, uh... I was talking again with Rick Chanchez about this last night. Uh, shows like yours and uh, others like you are doing so fantastically well uh, that the, the, let's call them the kindly, the legacy media, the so-called mainstream media, are being left trailing. I mean, at the top of our tree, yours and mine, the top of our tree, Tucker Carlson is turning in viewer figures that, uh, you know, would be the viewer figures for a year for most uh, mainstream uh, television uh, hosts. Uh, your numbers, my numbers, they're all up and up and up and up. What does that tell us about the future of so-called mainstream media? Well, it tells us that people are no longer buying the propaganda and that they realize, more importantly, they realize they're being propagandized. They realize that the news organizations are not actually reporting on news. They're reporting on what the powers that be want to have reported. And that has become, especially in this country right now, For you know, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on in your country, but here it's becoming more blatantly obvious. When you've got organizations like the New York Times, for example, uh, doing an investigation to find out who leaked the latest batch of Pentagon documents, and then finding out who that is and turning that person's name into the authorities, the journalists were doing that. Wow. That is just going to show that the mainstream media has turned into the henchmen of the elites. When you've got CNN and Fox News saying the same exact things about the pandemic, uh, fear mongering everybody, even when it was completely against the science that we were seeing coming out, people are waking up to this. People are waking up to the uh, all of the talking points, the endless support for Ukraine. Uh, when the people were not supporting it, it just people are starting to wake up to this. The, these PD, these people in the media are not representing and they're not fairly or and they really even even if they don't represent, that's OK. They don't have to represent anybody, but they should just report facts. They should report the news and they don't. And so people are flocking to places where they're actually getting a person. They can listen to that person and know that person is telling them the truth, the straight up truth not sugar-coated. You certainly don't sugar-coat anything. And that's what people are wanting. They're wanting the straight-up truth. And they're getting that in independent sources. The mainstream media have become the henchmen of the elite. That's a zinger that will live, Kim. And believe me, I know a zinger when I hear one. How do <laughs> people follow the Kim Iverson show? Uh, you could watch the Kim Iverson show Monday through Friday at uh, what time is it? It's well, 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. I'm not sure what time that is for you guys over there, uh, but no it's on we'll, Rumble we'll exclusively on Rumble. Fantastic, Kim Iverson. It's a pleasure as always to interview Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Quick break. Then it's Mark and Dumfries and Sean in Northern Ireland, both on the royal family. Can't wait. Stay tuned.
a big thanks to the people who support me on the Patreon page. I really have come to depend on the income from that. It costs a pound a week, not even the price of a cup of coffee in an insalubrious cafe. If you think you could stretch to that, please support me on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. Now, the Moats team have added a tiered system on my Patreon page where you can become an official Moats graduate. How about that? I speak as someone who graduated from nowhere, uh, from the factory floor in Michelin. But you can become a Moats graduate and legend. Uh, you can give a regular donation to support the show and my work. You can now upgrade from a, a mere Patreon to a Moats graduate at £10 a month as opposed to £5 a month, I think it is. Uh, and you can receive official Moats legend status for £20. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Is Princess Kate the new Diana, yes or no? Get voting on Telegram, on Twitter, on the YouTube community poll, or on the YouTube stream. 16,353 of you have voted so far. Remember, if you've missed some of tonight's show, it can be downloaded as a podcast. Just scan the QR code on your screen right now. Okay, on line one is Mark in Dumfries on the Royal Family. Mark, welcome. Hi, George. Just want to say congratulations on the win. I'm sure you're getting a bit sick of hearing that at the moment. Uh, but see, see what I was wondering? No, what no you I'll think. never be sick. I'll never be sick of hearing it, Mark. Thank you. I just, I just hope some of the people that have been saying it to me about you really mean it and they're not just saying it. I really hope so. I really hope so. See, what I was wondering what you would think about, see the, see the Kate stuff, what it would mean for the union. If the royal families have got real problems relying on stuff like that, what would it mean for the UK union? Do you know, what do you think it would mean for the Commonwealth? Does that, like, destroy diplomatic ties? What would it mean for the union, do you think? Well, I suppose it would depend how bad the outcome is, how bad the story is. I mean, at its most extreme, it could be the end of the monarchy. At its uh, least extreme, it's extremely damaging uh, in any case. Uh, fabricating of photographs, mysterious disappearance, and so on. Uh, and the king, look, <coughs> I honestly wish King Charles well. I don't want to see him suffer. I certainly don't wish him death. I'm religiously precluded from wishing death on anyone. So... Uh, I, I, I say this with circumspection. Uh, it, is, it is important that they level with us. He is the head of state. Uh, it is a united kingdom, as you've just alluded. Uh, he's, uh, his personage, his crown, is the basis of the state. It wouldn't be my choice. If I had my way, we'd be a modern republic. But... I can't have my way. Uh, it is a crown. It is a united kingdom. And therefore, we, we have a right to know, is he at death's door or is he receiving treatment, responding to treatment? We can look forward to many years of him. Why aren't we being told that? Uh, that makes you suspicious, isn't it? Mark, if, you, if you're inquiring after someone and no one will tell you, uh, where the person is, how the person is, your mind inevitably turns to suspicion that there must be a reason why they're not uh, telling you this. So, yeah, it could well have, depending on how bad this scandal is when it develops further, uh, there is uh, an extent to which it could impact on the union. Uh, the royal family are... Popular, I'd say, in Scotland amongst supporters of the union. Very unpopular amongst those who wish to break the country up. Uh, so it would inevitably add to the numbers in the latter column and reduce those in the former. 
the Commonwealth would go on uh, for what it's worth, which isn't that much, it seems to me. Um, I wish it were, but I don't feel it much. I don't feel the Commonwealth is playing any kind of significant role uh, in the world today. Last word to you, Mark. Um, I just feel, I, I was a unionist, but I feel the level of lies here with the royal family, something has to change. Yeah, you might be right. Uh, you might be right. Uh, I mean, the state of Britain is such, uh, you wonder that so many of us want to keep it going. Uh, and uh, in that, I think you and I are not alone. Monkey Boy says, it's obvious Kate is taking a second job to help pay the high cost of school uniforms. Uzi One Millimeter says, abolish the monarchy. Piers Corbyn says, I'm afraid I cannot get myself too excited over Princess Kate, especially now we have Islamophobic war criminals in charge of the Blairite Labour in name only party. You touched a lot of bases there, Piers, in one single sentence. Very well done. Sean in Northern Ireland wants to talk about the royal family. Go ahead, Sean. Hello, George. Uh, I just wanted to say I watched your maiden speech in Parliament. You know, very well spoken by Rochdale. Oh, yes. Thank, um, you. I, Thank you very I, much. Thank I you. just had a I just had a theory on what might have happened to Kate. Uh, I think mm -hmm. she's always looked very thin and pale and it looks more like a, 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 a bulimia or something like that there. I think maybe operation could have been something to stop her organs getting into multiple failure. That could have gone wrong. And the picture of her with her mother in the car there, she there's no colour at all to her face, sunglasses on. Uh, I just don't know. It's, I, I, it's very, I, I've very... seen that picture. It's on the screen. Uh, yeah, it's on the screen now, Sean, that picture. Uh, is that really her? It doesn't look like her to me. Uh, and that person got a fat face, not a thin one. Um, I actually don't think she's ever looked bulimic. I think she looks fabulous, actually, as might be obvious by this stage in the show. I think she's uh, a tremendously beautiful woman, and I, I pray that she fully recovers from whatever it is that is ailing her. But until we know, uh, Sean, uh, inevitably people are going to speculate, and moreover, they have a right to speculate. Thanks for the call. Queen N. Jinga Lives says, Kate defecting to Russia. Not a bad idea. Yeah, indeed. Uh, the Risen People of Era says, Kate has become Borg, sentient. AI has now taken the throne and is now automatically trying to draw a narrative. Kate has turned against humanity. His palace is trying to keep it all under wraps. Thank you. It's, it's a point of view. Uh, Keel Jones says, did she get the same treatment as David Miscavige's wife. I don't know who David Miscavige is, and therefore his wife. Uh, Domenico is in London uh, on the uh, royal family. Let's uh, hear from uh, Domenico. Go ahead. Uh, hello, George. Um, I wanted to uh, quickly ask a question um, with regards to royals. Do you think that they uh, provide a sort of template for, in a sense, uh, the rest of the corruption that goes on in Britain in a way in which yeah, people they're the head. Accept... They're the head of it, aren't they? Yeah, yeah I mean, so... we've got a pyramid, a rotten, we've got a rotten, crumbling pyramid of a country. I should, I should say here, Domenico, I take no pleasure at all uh, in saying that. Uh, unlike some on the left, I don't hate my country. Actually, I love it. I love its language, its culture. I love its football more than anything else. From Aberdeen to Accrington, Stanley to Bristol uh, Rovers. Uh, I, I love this country and therefore don't want to see it failing, falling apart and rotting away, which I believe it currently is. So uh, this is not any kind of joy for me to be charting the extent to which 
uh, the things that made me love this country are increasingly uh, crumbling in front of our eyes. Uh, go back, uh, Dom. Come back. Yes, I, I totally agree. And I think that I've been living here for nearly 20 years. And from abroad, we have an idea of Britain for, as being a place of uh, fairness, transparency, honesty in government, lack of corruption, things going well and things like that. But once lives here and learns, and the more you learn, the more you understand that it's a pyramid, pyramid of corruption, rotten corruption. And, and one, uh, uh, one that comes here learns to love this country, but at the same time cannot understand how people in general can be kept in such ignorance as to accept abuses of this kind. If one learns about, for example, Cornwall, and the way in which it's basically a fiefdom, it's a private property of the prince, or the, yeah, the prince in, in this case. The king. And the king, yeah. excuse me. It's a private property of the kings. It's unbelievable the way, the way in which people are treated in Cornwall. And the fact that people believe that Rishi Sunak is worse than the king, this absolute nonsense. The king is worth billions of pounds, for which he paid zero taxes when he inherited all that, all that from, from his mother. It's an unbelievable state of affair, which I cannot think how people don't even. When I speak, to, when I speak, when I talk about this with my colleagues, and in general, generally people here in the UK do not know any of this. They don't know any of this. No, no, they don't. I'll tell you what. Uh, thanks, Domenico, for a great call. Uh, the best man on this is Norman Baker, uh, my former parliamentary colleague, man I worked with on the Killing Kelly. Uh, documentary. Uh, he was uh, uh, one of the executive producers of that, and we based a lot of our work on the leads given in his book, The Strange Death of Dr. David Kelly. But in his other life, as it were, he is the one man who's dived most deeply into the deep and murky waters of the British royal family and the financial corruption therein. Uh, he's written several books on the royals. I, I recommend them to everybody. Norman Baker, B-A-K-E-R. Now, I, by people who are better educated than me have drawn this to my attention. Miss Kavija is the head of the Scientologists. Shelley Miss Kavija, the wife of the head of the Scientologists, has been missing for over 16 years. Wow. That's definitely a mystery. Let's hope Kate comes back quicker than 16 years. YouTube comments, Michael Stephen says, William spoke out against the war in Palestine. His mother was maybe killed for speaking out against war. Nah, I think she died because she was 94. Uh, Claire Gillies says, a pic of Kate in the car with her mother looks nothing like Kate but does look like Pippa. That went over my head. Who's Pippa? Uh, Mark F. said, Kate told Workshy Willie to cut out the colonizing. Uh, oh, I'm told Pippa is the sister of Princess Kate. On line two is John in Massachusetts on politics in general. John, welcome. Hi, George. Can you hear me? Very clearly, you're you're on to the rest of the world. Go ahead, John. <laughs> so, uh, congratulations on your recent election. It's uh, pretty interesting to see a man Thank you. of Thank your you. type get elected this day and age, uh, especially with all that's going on uh, internationally. Um, my you. question <laughs> for you would be, considering all this vice divisiveness that we see in the world today, and uh, particularly here in America, I feel like people, most people are good. Most people are, are good people. And they, they stick to the status quo and they have trouble believing that a country like America that they believe is good, and I, and I believe at its core it is good, uh, could do such horrible things uh, to, you know, the Iraqis or the Palestinians or, you know, take your pick. In your lifetime, over your lifetime, a lifetime of discussing these matters with people in such divisive ways. Have you ever found a, 
a way to really get through to people without alienating them from their beliefs? That's all the questions I had. Well, I think so. Yeah, it's a very intelligent uh, question, too big a question for this hour and this medium, perhaps, but a very good question. Uh, one must conduct one's argumentation, agitation, uh, as um, peacefully and harmoniously as it is possible uh, to do if one is to make converts. And the point of the exercise is to convert people who either don't have a position to your position or even people who have the diametric opposite position to your position. And I have had considerable success with both. If I take uh, the Iraq war, for example, um, the vast majority of this country uh, were against me totally uh, in the run-up to, during, and even after uh, the Iraq war. And that was only 20 years ago. 20 years on, the vast majority of people in Britain agree with me. And many of them are kind and brave enough to come up and tell me uh, that they hated me and the stance I was taking on the Iraq war. And now they realize that I was right and the people they were following were wrong. I had one last night, a very, very fine man, taxi driver in London, took me from Parliament to where I was staying. This man, in 2003, was one of those who hated me. And now, he's an avid watcher of this show. He le listens to the podcast whilst driving his cab. He donated money to the Killing Kelly film. And he shares my videos everywhere and argues with people in the cab about me. How's that for a conversion? I pray for that kind of conversion. And by the grace of God, the prayer often comes true. But what you can't do, John, you can't be dishonest. You can't pretend there's two sides to genocide. You can't pretend that there's two sides to what's happening uh, against the Palestinian people in Gaza right now. You have to be honest. There's not two sides on genocide. You're for it or you're against it. And if you are for it, you have lost your human bearings completely. Well, one of the good things about these shows is I get to go to my good wife now, right now. She's elsewhere in the building. What's rattling, Gayatri? You know what? The last time I wore this dress, people described me as a QR code, which I thought was so funny. So I just semi covered it this <laughs> time. <laughs> um, and uh, okay. people are also interested in your dressing today because your tie looks very interesting, but people can't quite identify what it is or says. Well, let me tell them that my wife bought it for me for two pounds from a vintage second-hand clothes store. She bought this jacket I'm wearing for four pounds, a Jaeger jacket for four pounds, this evening from a vintage second-hand clothes store. So the tie and shirt cost six <laughs> British pounds. That's the value of having a wife like Gayatri. She does a lot of shopping, but it's almost always second hand. And as you can see, she's got good taste. Otherwise, she wouldn't be married to me. <laughs> Gayatri, the, this tie is Chinese characteristics. I haven't yet found out what they say, but I've got friends Let's in China. A, I'm going to ask exactly, them. Exactly. We'll take a picture of it and ask them. Yeah. What right, else is let's that go like? to Let's go to the royals. Uh, the poll asked, is Princess Kay the new Diana? Cherie on your Patreon says, that is an insult to Diana. The humanity in Diana is replicated in Harry, where he will break protocol to hug someone or pick up someone from the floor. And Gillian Drake says, Diana, Diana was a one-off and her popularity was real. She was a special individual who touched us all. 
With her gone and the way she was treated, I have become a Republican. The late Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip had an appeal, but I cannot wait to see the back of the rest of them. And our friend Fra Hughes says, that's an interesting comparison. Let's hope she doesn't suffer the same fate. The curse of the royals normally leads Amen. to a fatal condition. Let's hope that indeed. Amen. Amen. Now, no, that, that's yeah. right. I mean, uh, Diana, Diana was wildly popular. Something changed about Britain uh, in mm. the wake of Diana, even on the day of the funeral of Diana, which I watched, I remember it well, uh, on the sofa uh, with my eldest child, Lucy, now the mother of five, but she was a, a young child then, and we watched it together, and we, I remember saying to her, this is something not quite British, about this uh, funeral. Uh, it was kind of, I eerily say, a kind of continental feel about it. It wasn't the buttoned up, reserved, stiff upper lip uh, Britain that I grew up in. Maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing, but uh, something definitely changed in Britain uh, with uh, Princess Diana and her demise. Got time for another few, Gayatri. Yes, please let me allow uh, allow me to read this email from Tom Orr, who says the second rate soap opera that is PMQs is an absolute insult to the intelligence of the British people. Does anyone really believe that our political system represents us in any way, shape or form? And uh, here's an email from Paul Brown, who commemorates the 40th anniversary of the miners strike. Uh, he says, George, you correctly appreciate that Arthur, you, you correctly appreciate Arthur Scargill for his fight on behalf of the workers, except that it is never a good idea to pursue a dispute to the point of destroying your own job, a point that King Arthur has never accepted. It's an interesting point. Uh, of, well, let, you know, me, no, let me intervene I, on that. Uh, let me intervene on that uh, because I was there and I fought it every single day for a whole year. And I was close uh, to some of the leaders of the minor strike, not Arthur, uh, but to Michael Magahi, the vice president and leader of the Scottish miners. So I know that that is not true. Uh, the idea that they could have stopped the strike and saved their jobs is the precise opposite of the truth. Their jobs were to be destroyed and therefore they were on strike to stop the destruction of their jobs. The Thatcher government had decided to destroy coal mining in Britain, partly because of the strength of the National Union of Mine Workers. It was a classic feat of strength in which, a uh, test of strength, that they uh, decided they were going to break unions in Britain, and they decided they would take on the most powerful union in Britain, on the principle that once you'd broken the most powerful union, the rest would be easy. And so it turned out to be. So I'm, I'm afraid uh, your correspondent and I must beg to differ on that. No, I Go think, ahead. No, I think he... No, I think that is what he's saying. He's saying that King Arthur, uh, he didn't accept it. Um, but what I wanted to say is that if there is a similarity to the movement now in defense of Palestine. A lot of people are afraid to speak up, to yeah. stand up uh, and raise their voice, but others are very brave. Uh, Mark Ruffalo in particular, you know, walking onto the red carpet of the Oscars. Oh, and wonderful. I, I, how, I, I've how got to confess, I, don't know, I never knew who Mark Ruffalo was. You'll know better. But on this Gaza, he has been an absolute hero, a real yep. hero. There have been others, John Cusack, uh, the Irish-American actor, uh, and there are others, though not that many others. But no, Mark Ruffalo many, has definitely been the most All afraid to lose effective. their jobs. All afraid to lose their jobs is the point and um, comparison and similarity. Yeah. Right, so very quickly, uh, uh, yeah. an administrative, administrative point. Dear George, just want to let you know that YouTube is suppressing the amount of subscribers you have. Every time I watch the show, I have to resubscribe, which is very undemocratic. Uh, so please, anyone who is uh, experiencing the same, let us know. And I should, please, please subscribe. We have to go against this um, uh, suppression, of course. Uh, Paul Pritchett also says... Yeah, the more subscribers we have, 
the more people who like the show, the more we affect the algorithm, which will work, uh, <coughs> if unaffected, to suppress numbers on the show. That's why I keep saying, you know, share it uh, with like, your like. friends and uh, contacts. So very good. Yeah. Make sure that you are still subscribed in case yeah. somehow you've become unsubscribed to the YouTube channel. Yeah, more, yeah, that's, more, more. That's, that's, that's from Paul Pritchett, who also adds the point, uh, please be warned about people wanting to stand as worker parties candidates. Beware of the fifth column trying to infiltrate our movements. Uh, and in the same line, sure. we have an email from Joanna who says, congratulations, George and all of the Workers' Party. It's been an affront to democracy and decency the way in which we, in which the privileged twits have sought to ensure your voice is not to be heard. My point in particular is about the coalition with Jeremy Corbyn and all other parties who advocate against war and who stand for the right to freedom of speech. There are many other issues which will come into alignment, but I believe these are the two fundamental issues that make a coalition. Uh, so despite all the smaller differences... Well, you look can... on that, Gayatri. Uh, let, me, let me say on that. If only there was a coalition led by Jeremy Corbyn. I've been calling for it now for years, but he yeah. doesn't show any interest in forming a coalition. Uh, I've made it plain... I want him to lead a coalition. He'll be the leader. I'll merely be a supporter. But he's got to accept that he's not going back as a Labour MP. He's got to accept that it's over for him in the Labour Party. And he needs to step out of that quagmire and get to higher ground. And that higher ground is one which many people have been waiting for him to take. I haven't seen him. I've now been in Parliament for, what is it, nearly two weeks, certainly more than one week. He's still not come in to Parliament and sat down beside me. He hasn't That's sat so down anywhere. I haven't seen him at two Prime Minister's questions. He didn't come in, though he must have known uh, to my maiden speech yesterday, I tried to keep a seat right next to me because that's where he always sat. Look at YouTube, my speeches, over 27 years in Parliament until now. There's virtually not one speech in which Jeremy Corbyn is not sitting next to me. But he hasn't been sitting next to me. He hasn't been sitting anywhere. Is he staying away? Is, has he run off with Princess Kate uh, <laughs> to Russia? I don't know, because I haven't heard from him, except once. Our daughter, Orla, gave a performance <coughs> of Irish dancing for St. Patrick's Day, the day yes. before yesterday, I think. She looked so divine. Her Irish dancing so entrancing, so exciting, that a big tear rolled down my cheek, as you and can mine. testify, when we watched her. And Jeremy Corbyn, out of the blue, sent a tweet <laughs> congratulating Orla. He hasn't congratulated me on being re-elected to Parliament, but at least he congratulated Orla on her Irish dancing which was good yeah. of him, but not good enough. Okay, he has enough. to Let's hope. either do it, do it, or get off the pot, Jeremy. That's what I'm saying. Last words yeah, but, from you. Yeah, but Gadry. I just want to say that but for the greater good, he has to do it. It's for the greater good. We're, we're all doing this yeah. for the greater good. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is the last yeah. one, uh, talking about photos, um, uh, the one that you described uh, in the beginning of Kate and her children. Here's an email from Robert Doyle sending in an un, unedited photo of the good old days, saying just congratulations on your Rochdale victory, George. Here it is. Oh, my goodness. That's me on the back <laughs> row left, I think. Yes. Is it? That's, yes, yes, you are there. My goodness. What age was I Please. then? Do you know the date? 
I can yeah, only be well, it, I must have been told uh, primary. Charleston Primary, it's you at the back, George Galloway, John Mitchell, David Smart, George Wiley. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Oh, I look forward to seeing that. And that came from Robert Doyle. I remember, 1966. Robert. 1966. 66. So I was 12. I was older than Torin. Okay. How amazing. Thank you for <laughs> producing that. All right. I appreciate that very much. Last call, then, is from... James in Florida. James, what would you like to talk about? Hello, George. Congratulations on your tremendous victory. And it's an honor to speak to you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you so uh, much, sir. My, yeah, my question was, um, in your tremendous victory, uh, the man that came in second, are, are you at all going to be joining forces with him? I hope so. We've uh, we've asked him to uh, put up candidates for the local council elections on the 2nd of May uh, that we can support and encourage others to support them. So far, uh, it seems that he doesn't intend to stand in any further elections nor put up candidates uh, himself to do so. But we're working on it, uh, James. Um, he's... Uh, he calls himself Forrest Gump. He was the Forrest Gump candidate, and he did uh, fantastically well. And both of us beat the pants off the government and all the main opposition parties in Britain, getting almost two-thirds of the vote, which is truly something. Thanks, James. Norma, the legend, is the last call on the royals. Norma! In Bristol, welcome. Hello, George. I um, enjoyed your maiden speech. Thought it was great. But now, this is about David Clues. Yeah, it was lovely. I enjoyed it. <laughs> I got a bit of a cough. Um, David Clues. I wasn't very. Uh, I felt a bit uncomfortable about what he was saying about Kate. Um, and I know that we haven't heard much or anything since Christmas, or we haven't heard about Charles much. Um, but I think he was a bit sensationalizing because he actually said, one, she might be dead, two, she might be in a coma, or three, she might have walked out. Now, I mean, we should hear some facts. We should hear soon because we'll all speculate. But I think he was a bit over the top, George. Uh, well, of course, he's been accused of being a bit over the top before on things and turned out to be entirely correct. So uh, he's a journalist. Uh, he's entitled to speculate. We all are. Um, of course, these three outcomes are three of the possible outcomes. God forbid it's one or two. Uh, but if it's number three and she has down tools within the royal family, that too is extraordinarily significant. <coughs> but the point is, Norma, we have to speculate because we're not being told anything. And in a democracy, a constitutional monarchy, they call it, you can't keep parliament and people in the dark about the life and death of the monarch and his family. But Norma, thank you for that. You're always on the side of decency and compassion. Uh, I think it's been a great show tonight, a bit different to our normal show. We don't normally spend time talking about the British royal family, and only do so because, well, this is a very interesting turn of events. But I'll be back on Sunday with the mother of all talk shows, God willing, uh, and uh, it's at 7 o'clock uh, in uh, London time. Make sure with changes of time in the United States that you uh, get the timings right. 7 p.m. UK next Sunday mother of all talk shows. Good night.